Okay. Hello, I'm Misty Elder with Salina Art Center, and I am very excited um, that you all are joining us for Lunch and Learn today with Terry Evans. Terry has been exploring the complex relationship between humans and the land since 1978. Uh, I read that this morning and um, really got her start, I believe, uh, right here in Salina, photographing the amazing and vast prairies that surround our community. So, we are fortunate at the Art Center that we have had a very long friendship with Terry and that she was able to um, take this turn as a curator for dissonance and resonance. Her works are in collections around the globe and the list of museums where she has exhibited is really humbling um, to now have her in this role at the Art Center. Um, Dissonance and Resonance will be at Salina Art Center through July the 25th. Admission is always free, so we encourage you to come out and see this exhibition in person. I also want to take a minute to thank our funders, uh, the Salina Art Center Endowment Foundation, the Greater Salina Community Foundation, YW Legacy Fund, Sid and Susie Ritz, the McCune Foundation, the Middlecoff Foundation and the Steeple Foundation. Without their support, we would not have been able to make this happen. And one of the unique pieces of this exhibition is that during the exhibition, it will continue to grow. It's almost as if it's a living thing because as each artist visits Salina, they are adding something to the show. So you, it won't do you well to come visit at once. You're going to have to see it a couple of times over the summer if you can, because there will be new pieces added um, and some interactive experiences, which will be really nice. Um, I also wanna thank Ruth Moritz who had stepped in as our interim curator to really execute this show beautifully um, and bring it to life. And our gallery manager, Daniel Picking for hanging the show, he did an excellent job. If you have questions through this talk with Terry, please put them in the chat box or if you're on Facebook Live, put them in the chat and uh, we will go through as many questions as we can um, toward the end of Terry's time with us. So with that said, please welcome Terry Evans. Well, thank you. Um, you know, I, um, I was trying to remember when uh, I received the invitation, which I believe it was an email from uh, Sydney Soderberg asking me if I would be interested in curating an exhibition. And I found something, I, I hope you will correct me if this is wrong, because I can't believe it's been this long. But the only thing I could find with any clue to dates uh, was I, it said first draft of the contract or something like that. And that was April 29th of 2019. Does that sound about right? That's fantastic. So now we have the results of it on the walls. And I thank the Salina Art Center for giving me this opportunity. Um, as, as some of you know, the Salina Art Center has figured very large in my own life and has been important since it began. Uh, I was here at the beginning and living here in Salina. And um, so, so, it was really thrilling for me to, to have this opportunity. And I especially thank um, Ruth Moritz and Misty and the whole staff of the Art Center. So I'm gonna share my screen and just talk about what's in the show. I'm not there to show it to you in person, but I'm here to show you work and installation pictures that the Art Center has sent me and tell you about um, the artists. So I'm, and, and also about you know, I think I'll, okay, wait a second. I'm gonna share my screen. All right. So I wanted to tell you a little bit. I thought you might wonder how did I choose these particular artists. And um, I thought about this a lot um, because I wanted to bring to you 
artists whose work I know and whose work I respect and have a lot of affection for. And I also wanted to bring you artists who were not necessarily for the most part uh, working in ways that were similar to my own way of working. Um, my own work has been much about uh, landscape and landscape issues and how people and land are woven together. And each of these artists represents um, a very different way of thinking, except for probably Christina Seeley. She and I share the same values, but her work is very, very different than mine. So uh, I'm gonna start with Krista Wharton Dyke, uh, in part because she is the first artist's work you'll see uh, when you come into the art center. So when you come in, Dissonance and Resonance, you see these very colorful panels. And from the outside, you see these wonderful uh, bright Easter egg colors. But as you get closer, you see that, uh, that these are all images of violence. So this whole title, Dissonance and Resonance, is really about how these artists have chosen to deal with violence that is so much at the front of our minds in America right now. And, and, and then the resonance is about something else, about how we respond to that and about how we make our own peace with it in a way. Um, this, Krista's work here is titled Mass Observation. So what an interesting title. So these are all images that were made um, right after the, um, or, or during the many protests in St. Louis. Um, now my mind has left me. Um, the protests that were happening after the uh, murder of of Michael Brown, I believe, and in Ferguson, Missouri. And these are all images that Krista was seeing on the screen, media images. And uh, they're also, they're about how we perceive what's happening, how everything we know uh, about something like this that is not right where we live, how we perceive it, how it is mediated uh, by photography. But I thought the source of her title is particularly interesting. So this title, Mass Observation, comes from a study that was started in 1937 in Great Britain. This was about the time that Prince Edward abdicated the throne and there was great uproar in the palace and behind the scenes about this, but the media didn't cover it very much at all. So, uh, so the British people didn't really know what was going on. And so uh, a few people organized this vast project and recruited hundreds and hundreds of citizens to write about everyday life and what they observed, mass observation. And they brought this to the public and in, it may even still be going on. There may still be hundreds of people uh, doing this. So um, I found this really interesting because um, this is a way that citizens were given agency to respond to events uh, important events of their time. And for me, this is exactly what Krista is doing. As an artist, she is responding to the events she sees. And uh, they are, uh, they're very upsetting to her. And she questions whether or not it's even appropriate to use some of these images. Uh, but she does, she pushes forward and uses them. I'm gonna show you a few close-ups. This is what you see as you get closer uh, to the images. I wanted to uh, read you a few quotes from um, Krista. 
uh, before I take you to her, her second project. She says the purpose of her art is to ask questions. It's an invitation to pay attention. And she's, um, she's very interested in how, as I mentioned before, how photography changed over time, how it changed, um, how it changes the way we, we perceive events of the world. Um, but she's interested in bringing her art to the public without telling them how to think, simply to uh, communicate what she is seeing and trying to figure out how you insert art into people's everyday life. So um, this is her second project. This, this made me so happy because Krista is the only artist of the four who has created new work, particularly for this exhibition. I'm sure she will use it more in her future, but through uh, a very stressful time, a time that most of us have all shared, um, made even more stressful for Krista because she underwent a couple surgeries from which she has recovered wonderfully. Uh, but during this time, she made this new work. So this is called Transmissions. So you see the images of, at violent protests, and these were protests that were made um, after last summer's major protests, um, after, the, after the murder of uh, George Floyd. And uh, you see the symbols, probably most of you know what those symbols are, you know about swipe to text, but in case there are a few who don't, I'm gonna sh show you a little more. So she has put down a stencil and then spray painted over, over it with uh, the protest images in the background. And then if you take your smartphone, if you have a smartphone, you can scan this image here, which will take you to uh, this video, which I'm gonna play for you. And that will tell you how these images are made, how the symbols are made. Can you see that my, on my screen, my own face is covering it up. So there you have it. Phalanx. Okay. Um, so interesting, huh? I don't know if, if, maybe all of you knew that. For me, it was a lesson. I just, I learned swipe to, uh, swipe to text uh, from Krista. So just to sum up her work, and, and I do hope that all of you will see this uh, in person. And I will be there at the end of July, July 23rd to, um, to see the exhibition myself and also to talk about it. Um, but that is, that is an introduction to this beginning work of, of the show, which I think says a lot about, um, uh, a lot about what, what I think the whole show is about in, uh, in some ways. It, um, it really, um, it really talks about how violence is at the forefront of our lives and, uh, and how we can uh, begin to think about it and how prevalent it is in our lives. Justin Spitz's work is very different, but it, um, it talks about violence in a very unusual and different way. Um, 
I find his work very disturbing because um, these, these are young people and they're playing war games. And, you know, maybe many of you in the audience have children who do this. They, they play these um, airsoft games in parks or rural areas around Salina. Uh, this was new to me. These are games that um, Justin has photographed north of Chicago, uh, which by the way is where I am, where I live now. Um, and in the forest preserves, um, these, uh, these games are huge. Hundreds of kids play and they're all using uh, replica weapons. Um, this one, uh, this boy's mother made this fabulous camouflage outfit for him. Um, this one I find a bit disturbing. Um, I guess more than a bit. I find this sort of scary, this image. And here it is in the Art Center installation. You can see what a powerful installation this is. So uh, Justin has a very, has a way of um, striking a connection with teenagers uh, that allows them to be very comfortable around him. And so he can photograph with ease. It's almost as if he's invisible. I don't know how he does it. Um, so he's, has, he made many, many visits to the forest preserves where these uh, games were going on on the weekends. Um, so the kids are in full military attire and using, um, using the simulated weapons, which are extremely accurate. Uh, they are really replicas of real weapons. In fact, um, I read about the very uh, tragic situation. I think it was, I think it was in Tennessee uh, where a boy was killed by police because they thought he had a real weapon and it really, he really was an airsoft. Uh, player. So, uh, but, but Justin's pictures are not, they're not just to show the glamour, you might say, or the fantasy of this. He, he really has much deeper questions, too, which uh, I want to um, read you, uh, read you some of some of his thoughts about this. Um, his work is always about the transition and change in teenagers' lives. And uh, he grew up in, um, in a town in uh, South Central Illinois and feels that in many ways, uh, these pictures are similar to um, the, the, the whole way that he grew up. And he's genuinely interested um, in their experience. He says that um, he himself is not disturbed by the violence. He sees it completely as fantasy and um, doesn't think that it necessarily uh, inspires more violence. He, uh, so he's using this documentary mode, but in some ways he adds his own fiction to it. Some of these colorful smoke bombs are Justin's, so he's combining his own fiction uh, with, with what he's seen the kids playing. But, um, you know, I, I find it so strange that these children look like real soldiers, but they're not. You know, this, this is their fantasy. So, you know, maybe it's the same. Maybe it's the same as my granddaughter playing with her, with her dolls. Maybe it is truly pretend and does not escalate into anything else. Uh, Justin says that he's trying to understand the cultural reality of now. Uh, he's complicit in it. He recognizes that there are terrifying consequences. And he recognizes that there is, there is a darkness in it a sinister component in white suburban America, which is where he's been photographing. Um, 
So he's seen a very complex situation and complicated situation, and he's not um, making any simple judgments about it. Uh, he, he says the gun, all, his work before now has been also about teenagers, but, but really more about their transitions through their lives. He says the guns put the discussion into being about more than being about teenagers. He introduces this, um, this whole concept of violence. He has done a stunning um, design for the installation of these pictures too. These are two that I showed you at the beginning. And moving now to uh, Christina Seeley, um, her work is about climate change and it's about um, trying to bring, trying to understand uh, human connection with nature and how we need to be more uh, aware of it and how disoriented we are to natural spaces. Um, and she also talks about how media, um, just, just as Krista does, she's also talking about how media in some ways keeps us from that connection. It represents nature in a way that is uh, a false sense of connection. Um, this particular image, I think, is, is very interesting. So you see the very center one at what we might say is infinity. That is the size of a four by five uh, sheet of film. She, she made this picture on a trip to, uh, to Antarctica uh, on a with a special fellowship group. And it's really about how the glacier is sometimes feels like it's receding. Sometimes it feels like it's coming forward. And this shifting sense of time and space in climate change and how uh, we never know for sure exactly where we are in it and, uh, and how we're looking at it. I think in the, uh, I haven't, I've only seen this on screen, uh, but the way it was described to me, it actually sits in layers. And so I'm very, I really can't wait to see this uh, in person. And then uh, she has a video called Dissonance, which is um, for her the most important work she's doing right now. Well, I would say the work that's the most meaningful to her right now is this video, Dissonance. And I hope you'll have time to sit there and actually uh, watch the whole thing. It's a very meditative piece of work. Her, her work, I would say, has a lot of spirituality about it in a, um, in a way that's, that's directly connected to nature. So in this one, in this video, uh, let's see, it doesn't, I don't have any clips of that, but she's, she holds a piece of ice until it melts in her hand and until her hand is numb and has no feeling. And so it's about this idea of the connection breaking apart and also holding this, this very uh, strong connection to, uh, to nature. And she's, she's done a lot of work about water. And so this connection to ice is, um, is very important to her. Um, she says that uh, weather shows our own limitations. Um, in thinking about her home, she's from California and her home now feels like it's always on fire. So that is the dissonance. Um, and so that, that has been a big uh, motivator for her. I wanna show you a few other things from her installation. Uh, she told me about this fox the first time I met her, which was some years ago. And uh, she felt this real kinship with this fox. You know, underlying everything about her work is this 
idea of our kinship with nature and what that means and what it asks of us. So when she was out, she outside and exploring, she saw this fox and they made eye contact and stayed that way for a long time. But the interesting thing is, in addition to that, showing this fox on the barren brown ground is an example of climate change because of the snow melting earlier, the snow, which is actually camouflage for the white fox. So that's what these two pictures are about. And this one um, is definitely about uh, kinship. So these are uh, daguerreotypes, large daguerreotypes, that early process from early photography um, of, of animals from the Harvard Museum of Natural History. And so they're printed on this mirror-like surface. So when you're standing directly in front of it, you see your own face. You see your own face merging with, uh, with the face of the animal in the daguerreotype. So this direct connection, this direct kinship. I'm very excited too to see these in person. And finally, I'm going to um, Tanika Johnson, who's from Chicago. Here's a sort of distant view of her uh, installation. You can see Christina's work on the left. Um, so Tanika is an extraordinary artist from whose work is all about social justice issues. And um, uh, her neighborhood in Chicago, she lives here in Chicago in the neighborhood that's uh, right next to mine. And um, it's considered uh, a high crime area. There are many people who would not come to this neighborhood. And yet for, it is her home. She has a deep sense of place there. And she grew up there, she lives there now. Her work is very much about defining this, um, this her whole neighborhood in, uh, in a new way. Uh, not even in a new way, but in a way that allows other people to understand the connection she feels. So I'm going to show you a few details of this map. So you see, so this is a map of Chicago. And what Tonika realized when she went, she's uh, living on the south side, she went to high school on the north side, and she realized that the street she lived on continued a clear far north onto the north side. And she started thinking about that a lot, how different they were. And you see the uh, green dots on the south side. This is the African-American neighborhood. On the north side, all of the blue dots are uh, is primarily white. The other colors, I believe the orange ones are the um, uh, Latinx neighborhoods. And, uh, and the Asian or the red ones. Um, so you can see this difference. So here is Ashland Avenue and you can see how it changes from North to South. And um, so she had this idea of asking people from the North side to meet people from the South side who lived at corresponding addresses. So same address on the North side as on the South side. And the way she was thinking was that she wanted people to begin to understand structural racism, but she wanted to do it in such a way that invited people in without judgment, invited them in and allowed them to see structural racism without feeling that they were being blamed. Um, she has a very unique way about her. She, she, um, she wants to include people. She doesn't want to divide people. 
Uh, she said, how are we going to improve our country? It can be done through personal relationships and shared passions. Art does this. This is what her art is all about. So, um, so this is uh, Wayne on the south side. I mean, Wayne in front of, of um, I believe this person is Natasha. So there's Natasha on Wayne's front porch. And here is Wayne in front of her home. And so they got to know each other and they spent time together. And what she suggested that people do when they got together was take a walk around each other's neighborhoods and compare, compare what they had. Um, and so for example, people would find that, oh, on the north side, they had access to a lot more playgrounds, a lot more grocery stores, um, a lot more programs for kids. And uh, so this was in no way judging the individual, but it was showing examples of racism built into the geography. This is, uh, just a minute, I just forgot their names. Okay, I'll find that eventually. So this is at North Side Neighbors, and this is Maurice on the South Side. And uh, if you go to her website, Tanika Lewis Johnson, there's a little video that shows Maurice taking uh, his new friends around his neighborhood and showing them his neighborhood. So, uh, so she, would, she would suggest that the map twins, as she calls them, would ask each other questions about their neighborhoods. So I thought it would be interesting to bring this project to Salina, which is so uh, vastly different from Chicago and begin to ask yourselves, ourselves, uh, some of the same questions about our neighborhoods and how they have come to be the way they are. So, uh, Let's see the pictures. The pictures on each side at the top are the north side homes and then the bottom are the south side homes. And so um, that is our show, but that's just a mere sample. And uh, I'm hoping that you have questions uh, and that we can begin to have a conversation about this. Um, let's see, I can quit sharing my screen here. Okay. Um, so, so let me know your questions. There's no way in this um, slideshow that I can, I think, really share the excitement of these artists. Uh, several of them are coming for residencies. Um, Justin Schmitz is there in Salina this week. Um, and I think plans are still unfolding about uh, the other artists. So, um, so let me know your thoughts. Okay, so we will open it up now for questions. If you are on Facebook Live, please put your questions in the chat. If you are on Zoom, you are welcome to unmute yourself and ask your question of Terry personally. And show me your faces if you, you know, if you could do that. I'd love to see your video faces. Terry, have you ever been a guest curator before? And what challenges did you have while organizing this expedition? Oh, thanks. <laughs> That's such a good question. No, I have never been a curator before. This is my first opportunity. Well, fortunately, I had the guidance of the Salina Art Center because, uh, you know, there's so many details that go into an exhibition. And um, my responsibility was to um, suggest the artists and to write an essay uh, about the show, which I did. I, there's a brochure, uh, small catalog about the show available at the Art Center. 
and um, keep in touch with the artists about what they wanted to show and how they wanted to show it. So I became in some parts the liaison and in other ways, the artists were directly in contact with the art center. But, you know, I will say it was a much bigger job than I had ever understood. It's much, I think it's easier to be the artist than the curator, but it was great fun too. Great, thanks. Terry, why, why do you think it is that art and artists are uh, so able to kind of bridge the gap between um, opinions and understandings? And you think about Tanika getting people together and uh, seems like in a non-threatening way uh, they are able to look at their own surroundings in a different way. What is it about art that allows that in the human mind and spirit? I think uh, art, you know, the art that, that you probably remember in your own mind and that I think of in my mind is, um, is art that uh, that does a couple of things. One, it, it connects to something inside me uh, that words, well, art can be words too, but, but it connects with something inside me that maybe I haven't spoken or maybe, but that I feel deeply and, uh, and, 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 and it resonates with me in in some way and even if it's disturbing you know it may it may connect with something in me that um that i hadn't thought about but that maybe it'd be a good idea to think about and to recognize and i think artists are sometimes able to bypass that that conscious very opinionated part of ourselves. And other times they're not. Other times the work is directly political. But I think the work that, that moves me the most is that is that work that connects with my my inner spirit in some way. What what do you think so? Well I, I do and I think that that's why contemporary art is so uh, wonderful because it 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 does link with our current um, issues and situations and uh, a lot of things in uh, art that's not contemporary we don't understand because we haven't taken enough art history lessons to know what the symbols are in mm -hmm. those paintings and so we look at them as beautiful landscapes or whatever when they really meant something different um, or sometimes meant something different at if you lived in those times, so. Yeah, interesting insight, yeah. Other questions? Sarah? You're muted, Sarah. Do you have to unmute them, Misty? Um, no, she's unmuted, but we're still not hearing you, Sarah. I'm not sure why. Is it just a volume issue on your computer? Hmm. If you want to type your question into the chat, we can we can get it that way. <laughs> nice to see you, Sarah. Terry? Yes. This is Mary Lemon. Um, yeah, hi, Mary. Hi, it's so good to see you. And thank you for doing this wonderful work and sharing it with all of us. Um, those you. of us that have known you for many, many years um, may not have been aware of the transition of your own particular artwork. Do, can you take just a few minutes and share where you are now in terms of um, 
exhibitions? What, what are you working on? Uh, All right, well, for just a minute. Um, so there's this one of my pictures behind me. You can't really see it very well, but it's, um, uh, I've been working uh, on a series of pictures that are really exploring, um, re exploring um, protected prairies and parks that have uh, unique examples of uh, untouched ecosystems. And I'm, instead of doing them in single images, I'm making, uh, I, I will visit a place many times like this place right here is actually uh, the prairie that has belonged to um, Nick and Joyce Fent. Uh, Nick has passed on um, out north of Salina a few miles. And so I visited the prairie several times at peak blooming season a couple years ago. And then I had I don't know, hundreds of images to use to recreate an image that was, um, uh, that I hoped would be close to the spirit of that place. So, so that's, that's what I'm working on. Um, Thank you. Um, but, let me see if I can think of questions. Well, let me ask you some, or, let me ask you something, and then that could lead me to comment more. Is there a, of the work I showed, um, is there a particular artist that you found um, a little more challenging than another one, or that raised some interesting questions for you about, uh, about the work that you liked or that you didn't particularly like? And I would love to uh, give my own comments about who, whichever one that might be. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Oh, okay. I started it out. Um, yeah, because my question, I guess, is more of a comment and it's along the lines of what you just spoke about, Terry. Um, but I found the photographs of the teenage war games particularly disturbing. And especially in light of seeing them right after the, the protest, you know, um, uh, photographs. And I, I do find it really interesting that the photographer doesn't really think that these necessarily lead to sort of violent impulses in these kids that are playing these, these very accurate war games, you know? Um, it's clear that it's all white teenagers that are, that are playing those games. And we know how dangerous it has been um, for uh, people of color to be holding a toy <laughs> gun you know and um right there in chicago i think you mentioned that one right mm -hmm. um the, the boy that was shot because of that anyway i just you know i think of um uh kyle rittenhouse who was a teenager who showed up you know traveled to get to wisconsin to um and, and killed people at a protest so anyway that whole thing I, I find really, um, it was really striking. And then to layer on top of that, these um, people getting together from the two different uh, uh, neighborhoods in Chicago and meeting each other and getting to know each other and having conversations about the neighborhoods. I just, the whole thing is really powerful and I'm, I'm very um, impressed with, with how you brought it together. And thank you for including climate change. So there we go. Well, thank you. Um, I, I will say that I asked Justin about that. Um, you know, these all seem like, these are all white kids. And he said, well, there, yes, cause that's where they live. But he said, every kind of kid uh, I was trying to find the quote because I thought it was sort of funny. He said, he said, every kind of kid plays this. And he said, they can be black or white or um, Latinx. They can, uh, 
but he said they can be healthy kids who have nutritious diets or they can be kids who just eat Cheetos. And uh, he said there is, it's just, it's widely popular. So, um, so definitely his example um, supports what you said. And, and I, I find it very disturbing no matter who plays it. But, um, and, and that's actually one reason I pulled out that one picture of the sort of woven camouflage to point out that this boy's mother had made that uh, outfit for him. And because, um, because I wanted to point out that parents are often involved in this. And, and this one site, oh, and when you come to the show, see, watch the video. Um, Justin also has a video in this. And the video is, um, is actually action about one of these games. And he interviews kids and he asks them about what their favorite, I think it's what their favorite war movie is or their particular scene in a movie and that forms the interviews. But in the background, you see um, all of these structures. They have, they have whole layouts with structures where, where they organize the battles. And, um, and a lot of times the fathers are involved in helping them with this. So, um, so I, I don't, I don't know what that says. I find our whole uh, gun culture very disturbing. I know it's very different in Kansas for hunters. Um, that's a very, that's a different thing. But uh, anyway, I, I agree with you. Um, what else? Terry, we did have one question um, that dealt more with photography and the switch, the change, the evolution of photography um, from when you started with the really capturing aerial images to today where photographs are so easily manipulated. Um, how do you feel about the concept of photography capturing reality um, today compared to maybe even 25 years ago? I don't think photography has ever captured reality. It always had a particular point of view. And uh, now, the, you know, the most we can do is um, there are rules in press photography about not manipulating any photographs that is submitted for publication. And yet they're almost all digital photographs or digital captures anyway. Um, so, no, I, I appreciate it very much. I could never do the work I'm doing right now if, if I, I started out thinking, well, I'll just make all these pictures of the prairie and then I'll make all these prints and then I'll lay them down on the ground and I'll figure out which ones go together. And, you know, now I do everything in the computer. I mean, this is just how I started this work a few years ago. Um, and, and also what I used to say about my own landscape work is that it was about the facts of the landscape. But you know, that only goes so far. We can see the facts of landscape since white settlement. We can't see the facts of the landscape before that. And it was very much used and inhabited. And uh, so, um, you know, so, so I, I think of photography as a tool, a tool for making pictures that almost always have a point of view. Okay, one of our Facebookers says that um, he does not think that the war games are nefarious. So I think, oh, I think that piece is gonna, that particular part of the show is really generating a lot of conversation. In the oh, good. I'm, oh, I think it will. And it's wonderfully strong work. Um, I wonder if that person would be willing to join the conversation and say a little more about that. I'd be very interested. Okay, I will read what he says. Um, let's make sure. They appear, they're not as nefarious as they appear. One could argue that by providing a fantasy outlet that violence may actually decrease. Okay. 
Thanks, I appreciate that contribution. Um, another commenter um, asks if we know when Tanika will be here in Salina. What I do know for sure is that on June the 10th, we are showing Tanika's film, The Folded Map Project, where she interviews um, many of her map twins um, at the cinema. And so we will show all 55 minutes of that film at the cinema. And then Tanika will be joining us for a conversation about that film. Um, we're still um, in determination. I, I'm pretty sure she will be here in Salina to do that. But if, if she's not able to be here, we will zoom that into the theater. So we'll still have her live with us that night. So for sure, mark down June 10th and hopefully she'll be with us for a few days around there. Terry. Yes. This is Karen Black. How are you? Hi, Karen. How are you? I okay. wanted to comment again about the photography, the pictures of the people with weapons. The first thing I thought when I saw these pictures was, my, isn't this different from cap guns when I was young, which were not terrifying because we didn't live in that kind of world. So what I think it says more is our own terror than whether these children will become violent or shoot up a high school or something. I kind of agree with the Facebook person who said it, it could just be fantasy to these kids. <clears throat> it does bother me though that their parents are involved so wholeheartedly in these adventures because it does show a lack of sensitivity to the culture we're living in, which is extremely violent. Uh, and we really need to, I don't particularly object to their playing games. We don't do that here, but we have paintball. And there's a place south of Salina where for recreation, people go out there and shoot each other up with paintballs. Well, are they going to be violent, horrible people? I don't know. But <clears throat> I think we need to have a clear division between what is weekend fantasy for these kids and do they understand how quickly they could cross the line to where we are really threatened. Uh, the other thing I thought of, and I read this once about... Um, uh, particularly violent neighborhoods where people just kill each other because that's what they do, but they don't think of it in terms of taking lives. They're solving a problem or they're taking care of something, but they're not thinking, I just took a human life today. I mean, they're so divorced from uh, the meaning of humanity and of life that they're not really, they're so divorced, they're not thinking, I just killed somebody today. So I, in terms of telling us we got to wake up, this exhibit is very powerful. And thank you for arranging it. Oh, thank you, Karen. Yeah, and I do think, you know, I quoted uh, Justin as saying he didn't think they necessarily led to violence. He also, he hadn't seen that article that I saw about um, the boy being killed by police because he had a replica weapon, but he, he was not surprised. And um, he definitely is intending to show, uh, to, to promote discussion about the dark side of our culture. Mm -hmm. I want to thank Terry for being with us today um, and for putting this show together. As you can see from this conversation, there is so much to unpack in this exhibition, and I do hope you will come out and really spend time with it. I think that is that is a key to this exhibition. You really do need to spend time. It's not one that you'll come in and browse casually, I hope. I want to point out that we have Justin Schmitz with us tomorrow night on Thursday at six o'clock here in the gallery. But if you're not able to be here in the gallery with us, uh, we will be doing it on Facebook Live again and Zoom. So there's multiple ways for you to interact and hear Justin talk more specifically about his work. 
On June the 16th, we will have our next Lunch and Learn, and we have Maria Johnson joining us, and she will talk about Salina's segregated history. And at that point, we will introduce our map project, which will be inspired by Tanika's work, but it'll allow us to really interact with a Salina map um, and ask some of those questions. And so that'll be a great opportunity for you to come down to the Art Center and participate in another fabulous discussion. And then of course, there's lots of things throughout the life of this exhibition. So please stay tuned and um, we will keep you posted. And we're hoping that we will have many more discussions like the one we just started to scratch the surface of with Justin's work. So please join us. Thank you very much, Terry, for being with us today and oh, come out to the Out Center. Thank you. And do come, come tomorrow and, and uh, ask Justin these very questions. You will have more interesting and deeper responses. Thanks, Terry. Thank you all for coming. <laughs>